Right, I'm going to say uh, 30 minutes. Is that all right, Kate? Yes, thank you. Brilliant. Take it away whenever you are ready. Oh. Oh, oh, she she queued one third of the band and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> Banned, man. Actually, that's it. Got the gear away. The course, isn't it? <laughs> that's actually part of the course. Really. It's, it's <laughs> we're, on, we're on stage in 30 seconds. Where the fuck's Phil got? <laughs> Is that right, Phil? Uh, I don't think that's fair. No, they're not. It's <laughs> hard <laughs> to change. Uh, my name's Benj, and uh, I kind of run this studio here, uh, as well as doing Wrangler and other. My name's Mal, uh, Stephen Malinder, um, and I do Wrangler with these guys and do vocals and bits and bobs and we all work together. And I'm Phil Winter, uh, and I hang out with those two. <laughs> <laughs> How did Wrangler come about? Uh, well, it's actually a project that me and Phil started together uh, about three, four years ago, was it? Uh, yeah. Um, and we kind of decided we'd try and do some really minimal, pure electronic tracks um just trying to kind of use one synth per track and uh that's kind of where the name comes from it's like wrangling with with a synthesizer to kind of get uh, a result um and then yeah we kind of like i guess something was sort of missing from the tracks and and phil sort of suggested we get mal involved <laughs> yeah and i've known mal for quite a while so uh it was just a sort of question of getting back in touch with him. Well, we were always in touch anyway, but sort of just letting him get aware of what we were doing and uh, getting him down to the studio. And what was the role that you wanted him to? Basically, it, 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 I didn't have any specific ideas, whether it be vocal or instrumental or anything. It was just more sort of what Mal felt comfortable doing and, and what worked best. So, uh, and that's still the case anyway. Basically. Yeah, I mean. Um, as Phil said, because I've been living overseas, um, and but I'd always Phil and I had always been in touch with, because we'd been friends and done stuff for many years, um, and it, so it wasn't when I was back. I was I was living in Brighton, and obviously I was speaking to Phil, you know, since I arrived back in Brighton, and straight away he kind of said, "Oh, you should really be, you should really sort of come to the studio. You should meet Benji. You should listen to some of these things that we've been doing." And I did, and there were kind of sketches of the things that. Uh, they've been working on and um, and yeah so I mean but it is it, it's funny actually I had to answer a question yesterday because I, I felt really bad the, the inference being that I just arrived for the photos at the very end and these so it was nice to say no I've actually even though these guys have been doing it I have been involved for sort of over two years really since I first came up two and a half years ago or something like that since I first came up so we it was really good to come up meet Benj and it was just I guess Phil knows me and he knows Benj and he knew that we'd be, a, it wouldn't be a, a problem just working out, working together because we, you know, we're, we're very compatible in that sense. So. And at that point it was still sort of, it didn't really have any agenda or anything like that, it was more just sort of us hanging out in a place like this, sort of exploring different synths really and uh, seeing what came out. So uh, There's kind of a, I mean, yeah, there is a bit of an agenda here, just generally in this studio because it's all, I've got lots of old bits of equipment that um, I've sort of put together over the years and and it, we, we are quite strict about using that equipment and trying to you know keep it really analog or, or sort of using the effects units and, and not really kind of using computer plugins really. I think I think uh, Wrangler how, how Wrangler works and the sound that it has and what's right and what's wrong that that is a kind of an agenda and loose. It's not an ideology, but it's certainly it's certainly we know there is a kind of rang, wrangler kind of effect in the wrangler sound. But I think the way it evolved didn't have an agenda in the sense that we were actually making, we were making tracks and doing things without really knowing what was going to be the end product. And I think, funnily enough, about well, it's a year and a half ago almost. Uh, yeah, it would be a year and a half ago. Somebody got in touch with me in Vienna and said, "Do you fancy doing a gig?" And I just went, "Well." Not, I don't know, you know, not just me personally. If I do it, I'd have to do it with these guys. And at that point, it started to kind of, I suppose, it started to form around the core of, of actually doing stuff. So, so there's been certain catalysts, and we were playing, we were doing gigs for probably, you know, until sort of nine months ago, and then, you know, Steve was involved. And he was like, "Well, it's great, but you haven't actually recorded anything that's kind of." come together as a, a body of work. We'd done lots and lots of things. And we sat down, and I think it was 21 pieces of music that we'd worked on. So 
it was a case of going, oh, I think we better capture some of this and that's so gradually it's it's kind of crystallised into what it is now and the release and everything. But as the bench says, what it stands for and what it sounds like is is quite deliberate and quite conscious. How it came together was was kind of just an, it just evolved really. Yeah. After a, after a lifetime, generally speaking, we had it all together. Pretty Absolutely. adequate lifetime of working with analog electronic instruments, and again. You can you can discuss this amongst yourselves. Is there is there something else to be discovered in electronic music that we haven't already discovered, or or, or is it a matter of kind of rearranging the bricks in different places? I think there's a certain it's something about recording really old equipment, but with really modern sort of digital recording. You you somehow be able, you're able to capture things in the in the electronics that you, you didn't really have when the equipment was originally made so it's almost like you're kind of um you know you've got the most high resolution camera and you're shooting something really kind of old and wonky with it sure. you're just you're seeing new things in that in that old equipment through this new process of digital recording right um i think that's, i think yeah i think benji's captured it the sounds may be the same but the context has changed and how we can approach them different and also People have changed, and so therefore, there's new people who haven't discovered them, you know. So, it, it, that that dynamic, there is a dynamic, and it is constantly shifting and changing. Um, but it is about how it is re, re, remade, re, re, represented, and and, uh, and how it really does come together. And as Ben says, that's the context for that has massively changed, even though the sounds and purity may may still relate to the old. And also, there's an element of uh, not endangered. Technology, but you know this—the technology that Bench has and the stuff that we use—is it is unique, and it's a—it's like a, to be quite honest, it's kind of an honour to be able to do these things. Um, and so, really, the, the fact that it, it is here is quite unique. Those sounds have been approximated, you know, with soft synths and plugins and things like that. But that this is a rarity to have this to be able to physically manipulate and do these sounds is quite unique. And whatever you say, these individual parts may have existed in the past. There may have been other people have owned them, but these guys, and you know, Ben just got them, and we, we were, they've all come together, and this is how it's kind of all, all aggregated in this place, and that is totally unique. You know. I think that's it. It's like sort of, you know, when the big moogs were made, you know, some of the first stuff that was done on them was like interpreting classical music, mm. you know, and you'd have these people spending years trying to play Tchaikovsky on them and <laughs> so you know and see how that's come you know right through to sort of techno or whatever you know the evolution of discovering stuff in that machine you know who's to say that this is the end it could go into some whole new type of music that doesn't exist yet that could work on a move yeah but that, that's always interested me why why with something like an analog sequencer it's it's basically like eight notes repeating and that was invented in the 60s, but that repeating dance music didn't get sort of di discovered until 20 years later. And that, that's amazing to me that mm. they could have made that music back in the 60s, but no one ever really thought of it. So I don't think you're kind of at the mercy of the instruments. It's almost the other way around, really. You're, and that is Phil, exactly what Phil says. Who knows what's around the corner? There could be some amazing new way of using a sequencer that we haven't thought of yet. Mm -hmm. Keep wrangling. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Tune in. <laughs> well, you know, you, you, you talk about dance music. I mean, obviously, you know, we, within electronic music, I guess we had this big breakthrough, which was sampling, you know, which was suddenly opened up, and and, and FM and uh, you know, di digital digital sound sources, which kind of moved it moved it a little bit uh, forward. But has there been anything since then that's really kind of shaken the whole thing up? You know, you've really got to look at this again. Really, got to reappraise what's going on here. Well, obviously, sampling—you know—that that was a major change because you could capture and manipulate existing sounds electronically. Um, and then, I suppose it's sort of what what's nice is to rediscover those old instruments that that maybe weren't exploited fully because a new instrument came along and everyone sort of jumped onto that bandwagon, but. Um, 
Yeah, I think you know the, at, at the moment and maybe for the last year or so, it's this sort of development of the controllers that people use now for their laptops have just come on leaps and bounds from five years ago where you were limited to just having a mouse to control your laptop. Now there's all these crazy controllers. And that's obviously affected, I think, a lot of dance music, you know, that ability for digital composers mm. to really get in there and stuff like that. Mm. But it's still a laptop. Yeah. yeah. So it has its limits as well. But uh, And I think that will that will carry on. I mean, you see these, you know, videos of people just jumping around and they're actually playing music through their movement or whatever, or their brain thoughts or <laughs> stuff. And, uh, so there's all that to explore, I guess. How about dance music? I mean, we, we, we've touched on dance music. Uh, these days, it it's all stuck in this little character ca category called EDM. Well, I don't think all dance music is, but I think maybe what's popular at the moment might be. But dance music's always been a very multifaceted genre anyway. It's like saying rock, you know, when it's all just about indie or whatever. I think dance music has, well, even if not even necessarily dance music, but say electronic music or repetitive beat music, you know, it can be all sorts of things. So. Yeah, it, I don't know. It, it, I, you know, EDM just seems to be more about the mass participation rather than the sound. So the event that's taken over from the actual what sounds have played there. So it has, it's become this kind of, it's become this thing that everything's captured under an EDM umbrella, but it seems as though that that's driven more by events and, and promoters than actual producers as much as anything else. Um, it's it's a, a catch really. Yeah, and also that the the EDM music makers are able to play festivals and stuff like that now, whereas before dance music wasn't really a festival music as a live. Mm. Anyway. So what's changed there? I mean, that that was something I was going to come on to. Was, was the, the kind of inherent facelessness of, mm -hmm. of a lot of dance music, and, and maybe a lot of um, electronic music. You know, if you take it from that kind of craftwork route, where it's like, well, robots will do the job as well mm. as we can, so we'll have robots on stage. I mean, is it is still not the case that I think EDM is kind of largely faceless? But it, it's, it's, it's got a character now. Yeah, so. yeah, but it's also sort of as much about the light show and I think they've really sort of identified that if we just stick you know a quarter of a million pounds worth of lights on a stage people will respond yeah. and uh, whereas you know I think electronic music makers in the past you know might have been a bit involved in visuals but they were still getting their heads around how to operate a computer so it's like they've learnt that so <laughs> now it's we don't EDM because it's kind of personality driven in some yeah, respects, yeah. but it it is only in it's really weird because you know whoever it might be you know from you know Skrillex whoever it's all it's all the individual. There's no you're not aware of any collaborative process, which is kind of interesting because I'm sure a lot of the music behind that is actually the product of more than one person. <laughs> I'm not saying any more, but you know uh, it's interesting that it's it, it's kind of celebrity based music. And as celebrities, apart from you know boy bands and girl bands, which doesn't lend itself probably to, to EDM, it's driven by it's 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 the music that's a, appropriate for around a celebrity culture because it's based around celebrity individuals. So it's not faceless anymore, mm -hmm. but it, it's actually it's all driven by individual kind of names that that, that do it. And you sure. know whether it's you know Richie Horton or whether it is Skrillex or whether it's you know though. It, Thingy Mouse, whatever his name, Dead Mouse, whatever. It's kind of like weird that it's done that way. Um, so it's EDM, really, to me, celebrity music in that sense, or in, in the way it's presented. So it's not faceless, but it's not. It's it's not. I suppose we represent. I mean, I'm not talking about. We don't, we don't represent dance music. It, it might have a groove and it might have a beat, but we're not trying to do that. But what we represent is a is the collaborative nature of of making not just music but the creative process is naturally collaborative and so we're about that whereas EDM doesn't seem to represent that. <laughs> so you've got an album coming out in May or April? May. 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 Okay. All right. Well, April, May. 
April, April, May. April, May. April, May. April, May. The coalition month. It's May coalition month. April, month. Yeah. <laughs> Phil's going, hurry up. That's <laughs> not out. And are you taking it out on the road? Hopefully. Um, yeah, yeah. We do yes. play, so. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We love live. Yeah, we love playing live, so it's, um, yeah. We We're just through it. Yeah. 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 Light show? Massive light show that you put on We We do embrace the fact that, you know, three guys still have a certain sort of boredom threshold for someone looking at them. <laughs> but we do move around no. quite a fair bit, though, Phil. You know, he... <laughs> if you're in the mood. <laughs> if you're in the mood, yeah. But yeah, we, we use specials as well. And uh, it's all good. So it's going to be a nationwide tour finishing at Wembley. <laughs> Pretty much. Leisure Centre, Wembley Leisure Wembley, Centre. Yeah. <laughs> I know it well. <laughs> <laughs>